Anybody else ready? Yeah, let's run through a wall. That'd be awesome. Hey, good morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles uh, or your app or your whatever you're going to use this morning to follow along on Scripture, uh, Acts chapter 2 is where we're going to be. You want to go and turn that, hold your thumb there, hold your finger there. We'll be there in just a second. I inter- I'll introduce myself. My name is uh, T. Lusk. I'm the campus pastor in Columbia, uh, our Columbia campus that launched a year and a half ago al- almost. And so I've been down there for the pa- past year and a half, two years kind of getting that started. And uh, I'm excited to be able to be here with you. Uh, this morning, we're streaming to the Columbia campus, and so for, uh, first, I'll welcome you guys in the room. I should have started. This is backwards. Welcome to you guys in the room. This is take two. Welcome to you guys in the room. We're so glad that you're here, and welcome to those folks that are online. Uh, to, the fa- to the family that's in Columbia, I would like you guys to help me welcome them as they're, they'll be tuning in. So can you all welcome the Columbia campus as they, yes, they love you, and I love you. I'm super glad. Super glad to be with you guys. I miss our family down in Columbia, but we're, we're excited to open up God's word together uh, and be able to, to, string, to be able to, to share in this time together. Uh, the, uh, with this week, Pastor Jeff, as you saw, is in, in Nolensville, as we, has the grand opening. We're excited, and I, I mean, I just couldn't be more excited about that as a, as a campus pastor who operates out of a school right now, looking forward, really excited about what's happening in Nolensville, so I can, I can dream and have an image of what that looks like in the future. Uh, but also just in, in, in this morning, as Pastor Jeff's there, this morning, uh, Pastor Brandon, who's our college and young, young adults pastor, he was supposed to be here. He, got, he went down this past week and didn't feel well, and so I'm, I'm the backup to the backup, uh, and that didn't go so well for the 49ers, uh, so <clears throat> where's Alvin? I'm sorry. Um, I, that didn't go so well for the 49ers, but if nobody tackles me, I think I'll be fine. So... Um, Anyway, we're, we're excited to be able to open up God's Word together and, and kind of walk through this series that we're in uh, called At the Movies. And, and real quick, before we dive into the meat of, the, of, of what we're going to talk about this morning, I, I kind of want to give us a 30,000-foot view, just a what and the why of, of this series called At the Movies. And, and the beginning, uh, the, to begin with, number one, is many of y'all know, and we've said this over the past several weeks, that we started, Rolling Hills started in a clubhouse, but quickly we moved, we moved to a movie theater. And so as we kind of looked back and said, hey, in this 20 years, as we celebrate 20 years, this would be a great way just to kind of give a nod to where we started. And I think it's been fun, right? I I think most of y'all have had a good time. You know, there was an option where we would actually move back to the theater, and I was like, no, no, no. No, no, that's not, that's a bad idea. Uh, So you're lucky. We had to set up and tear down. Being somebody who sets up and tear down every week, you didn't want to do that. So thank, you're welcome for nixing that. Then secondly, you know, we, as we looked at this, it's kind of celebrating the 20 years. It, this is just a, one of those moments where you get to kind of recalibrate and remind ourselves of, of who we are and what we are as, as a church, Rolling Hills, but as the church that God is building, as we just sang about. And some of the core things about who the church is, some of the, the five like core tenets and core principles of who, what the church is, and we talked about this over the past several weeks, is evangelism and discipleship and fellowship and ministry and worship. Those are kind of the foundations, and so not only do we want to have the nod of where we started, we want to be reminded of really what the church is. And so as we use these movies, they're just illustrations, they're just moments that we're going to kind of pull the truths that we can see from them, but ultimately, it's about these five things that we would say, these are the core principles of what the church is, is a reminder and just kind of recalibrating ourselves as we celebrate this 20 years. And secondly, our third kind of thing is, is that Jesus used parables. You know, Jesus taught with stories, and Pastor Jeff has done a fantastic job of this. I think Pastor Jacob said it last week as well, but when Jesus was teaching, when he was on earth and he was teaching in his ministry, he would use the stories of the things that the people knew and they could see. And so they would be standing out in a field and say, there's a man sowing seed in a field, and listen, I've never sown seed in a field. You can judge me if you want, but I I, I wear boots, but that doesn't make me a cowboy. I I really don't know what it means to sow seed in a field. Right? I've just lost a lot of you guys. I'm sorry. But I do watch movies, and I, I do see these stories, and I believe that all of us, as we see these stories, and we can be reminded of, even if you haven't seen the movie, you can, you can see the, the, the principles that are there. And so we want to draw from these movies the principles that are in God's Word and use them as opportunities to teach these foundational things about who God is and, and what we are as the church. And then lastly, as a 30,000-foot view, this, uh, Pastor Jacob said this last week, and, and I, think, um, I think it's just a great, a great understanding. In Ecclesiastes, it says that God has set eternity in the hearts of men. 
that he set eternity in our hearts, and that means a lot, but it also, it, what it really means is that we can see in these places God's creativity. Pastor Jacob did use this quote last week. He said this, that Francis Schaeffer uh, said that the art is a reflection of God's creativity, evidence that we're made in God's image. The reality for all of us is that God is the creator. And as you look around, some of you have gone to places where you've seen just beautiful scenes and, and maybe you've, you've gone and seen art and, and movies that you just really just are beautiful, beautiful pieces of art. And in those moments, we get to see the creativity of God. As the creator of all things, all creativity that we can have, whether we want it to or not, it points to Christ. A beautiful piece of music, a beautiful movie, all of these things ultimately point to Jesus because he's the creator. His imagination is greater than we can ever imagine, greater than we can ever come up with, but in small ways, movies and books and art and stories, whether they want to or not, mimic biblical themes and narratives or they give us a picture in some small way of the beauty and the creativity of Christ. And so that's the, kind of the principles of why we're, why we do, why we're doing this series and, and what that means for us, if you're following along in your worship guide, is that sometimes, sometimes the message within the story is bigger than the story itself. Sometimes the message within the story is bigger than the story itself, and that's especially true in this movie. When we talk about Remember the Titans, it's especially true. I mean, this is a great movie. It came out in September of 2000. I, I remember going to the movie theater to see it. We watch it all the time. I mean, we watch this movie. It's probably my favorite sports movie. It, it, you know, kind of, there's a couple that kind of run in that, in that lane, but it's probably my favorite sports movie. But beyond a sports, it's a great football movie. And beyond just being a great movie and a great football movie, there's a lot in it that can teach us and that we can glean from and lessons about who we are and what we who we want to be. It's more than a football movie. It's a true story. It's a true story, and it gives us a snapshot of life together, of an important time in history, and a commentary, a great commentary on how we relate to one another, how people who come from different backgrounds and different places and different experiences and who even look different overcome those differences and work together to, create, to, to accomplish great things. And in the church, that's the... We, we see this in the movie, but in the church, there's a word that kind of describes what that tells us, what, what this movie kind of pictures for us, of, of people from all these different places coming together to work together and accomplish great things and overcoming obstacles. And that word is the word fellowship. The word is fellowship. And, and before we jump in too far, I want to I read a passage of Scripture from Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, and then we'll dive in uh, with these six lessons that I want us to walk through this morning. It says this in verse 42, it says, they devoted themselves, and the they in this passage is, is the people of God, that are this, this group of people that were there in Jerusalem, and the Holy Spirit falls, and it says that 3,000 people in one day, as Peter proclaims the gospel, 3,000 people come to know Jesus, and, it, and, and in this verse 22, or 42, it says they, that's the, the, those 3,000, plus the disciples that were there with them, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe and wonder, and, and many wonders and signs were performed by the apostles, and all the believers were together with everything in common, and they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Verse 46, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying favor with people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Let's pray together just real quick. Lord, thank you for your word, and thank you for songs that we can sing that remind us that you build your church, that you give us life and breath and everything, and God, we want to give you that breath back in celebration and worship of who you are and all that you're doing. God, we thank you that we get to be a part of it, and that you use us in such a mighty way, God, and you've used this church, these people in such a mighty way in, in Middle Tennessee and, and beyond. And God, we celebrate your work in those places. And God, we pray that you would continue to do more and use us to do it. And God, the fellowship that we have here as the body of Christ, the believers that are gathered in this campus and across all of our campuses and online, that this body of believers, God, that you would use to accomplish your will, and to make your name great, and all the places that you take us. It's in Christ's name that we pray, amen. 
So there's six essentials or six, uh, six, six essential lessons for every believer about fellowship that I want to walk us through. And, and the reality for most of us, I, I, I'm, I mean, I'm old. I'm not that old, but I'm old. I start feeling things that hurt a lot now in, in my mid-40s here. But they, I, I, so I, I know that I'm old, right? So slow down. But I'm the one who's saying it. Anyway, but fellowship is not a word that I use very often. It seems a little bit antiquated. It seems a little bit old, right? I mean, anybody else call, anybody call their friends on a Friday night and be like, hey, you want to have some fellowship tonight? Is that, is that how you say, hey, you want to come over and fellowship? You, you do. Okay, so there's one. Maybe there's a couple more that call their friends like, hey, would you like to come over for some fellowship? The, the reality is that we don't. Maybe, maybe our Gen X folks, y'all have made some bad decisions in, in your uh, fashion, so maybe you'll be, make some bad decisions in bringing words back. I like to poke fun. I'm sorry. But... but Maybe you'll bring back fellowship as a word that we use on a regular basis, but I know that we don't use it on a regular basis. But the reality is that this word fellowship is a word that in the scriptures, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, carries a great weight. Like it's one of the most important past, or one of the most important or most powerful words or concepts in the scriptures when you go back to the original language. Because God created us for fellowship. And as we go through this, the first thing that I, as we tackle this first one, the, the, re, the reality is that God created us for fellowship. And the first thing that it, the essential that we need to understand is fellowship begins with an invitation to a restoration of relationship. That fellowship begins with an invitation to a restoration of relationship. And, and if, I, if, I, if I could go back, I think I would rewrite this. It actually begins with a response to an invitation. See, the invitation has been given to the restoration, but it's a response that we have towards this invitation. If you go back to Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 1, Paul writes this, that God is faithful, who, called, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see, God has offered us fellowship. He's called us into fellowship with him. He's, he's calling us back into fellowship, and the reality is that it's, it's the restoration of a relationship that's been broken by sin. It, what happens in, in what we see in scriptures is that what he's, what, what's deep in our hearts, what's the longing inside of our hearts for fellowship with him, that there's something inside of us, deep inside of every human on the face of the earth, no matter where you are, no matter who you are, no matter where you've been, there's something inside of every human that desires this relationship with Jesus. It was put inside of us from the very beginning. It's what he says, he's put eternity inside of our hearts, this longing for something that's beyond what's here. One of the, one of the greatest sentences ever written by St. Augustine, a North African theologian that wrote, wrote this in, in 400 AD, he said, you stir, meaning God, you stir man to take pleasure in praising you because you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. That truly God has put inside of us this longing for fellowship with him. That we desire this relationship and it begins, this fellowship that we long for begins with a response to an invitation that he's put forth and the invitation comes when he sent his son Jesus. And listen, this is the good news. This is the gospel. We proclaim it every week and, and one way or another we're gonna proclaim this clearly every week because we believe that this is our only hope that Jesus is our only hope to this restoration that we desire, this fellowship with God that he created us for, that God came, that God sent his son, that Jesus is God in the flesh, and he came to his creation that rebelled against him, that said, in essence, because of our sin, what we said to God is, I can find what you put inside of me that can only be fulfilled in you, I can find it in your creation. So basically we said, forget you, I'm gonna find it in the things that you made. And throughout scripture and throughout every one of our lives, we can attest, we can have, every one of us have this testimony that if we look for hope, if we look for peace, if we look for what we're longing for deep inside of our hearts in anything, especially in any person, it's gonna fail us if that person is not Jesus. We put this longing inside of our hearts and he satisfied it with Jesus as he sent his son to die on the cross, to live a perfect life, to die on a cross, be buried in a tomb and be raised on the third day. And he invites us, all of us, who've rebelled against him into this fellowship with him that we were created for. It's a fellowship that happens when we trust him, when we recognize our sin is what it says, when we recognize and confess our sin and when we repent of our sin. We 
We place our faith in him and our lives under the submission and lordship, under his lordship and submission to him. And it says in scripture that we become new creations. And this relationship that was broken because of our sin becomes healed and we have fellowship with the one that we were created to live with. Created to live and have relationship with. So it begins, fellowship begins. We've gotta hear this, fellowship begins with a response to the invitation that God has given all of us to a relationship that was broken by sin. There is no fellowship. We can, have, we can have fun with people, but there is no godly fellowship that comes without beginning in that relationship with Jesus. And so the second thing that, that fellowship, what, what, is, what about fellowship that's important, essential for us to understand, is that fellowship is important because it gives us a place to belong and a purpose to fulfill. Fellowship gives us a place to belong and a purpose to fulfill. One of my favorite scenes in this movie Favorite scenes in the movie is, is when after kind of everything has kind of gone, kind of gone awry, like the, all the, the coaches have come in and the, the, these, the tension has risen between these two schools and these two groups of guys who are coming together to be one team. They're about to get on a bus and go to camp. I, I like to call that, I don't think this is the official word for it, but I like to call this who's your daddy scene. So this is when Denzel Washington, Coach Boone, he's about to get the get kids on the bus and Jerry Bertier, who, who's you know, the only All-American, comes up and he says, I'm the only All-American on the team and if you want us to play, and in us, he's talking about the white kids on the team, if you want us to play for you, these are the things that you're gonna do. And he lists all these things, this is what we need and we don't need this, and blah, blah, blah. And this is where I really realized in my life that I wanna be Denzel Washington because in this month, he, Denzel's character, Coach Boone, systematically, brick by brick, destroys this kid. Just wears him out. And I'm like, oh, that's so cool. I, I just, I mean, he makes this prideful young man just whimper and at the end say, you're my dad, which is just awesome, right? But what happens in that scene and what's happening really throughout the movie and that and past this and before this is all of these characters are looking for a place to belong. Things have kind of gone awry for them and they don't know where they belong. They don't know if they're gonna have a place on the team like they used to have a place on the team or maybe because this is a new place, they don't know where they fit in. These coaches don't know if they fit with these. So everybody's looking for their place to belong. In 2018, there was a study, a, a headline that was released after a study was made. And this is 2018. Remember, this is pre-pandemic. 2018, it said that, that loneliness is as lethal as smoking 15 packs, 15 packs, 15 cigarettes, not 15 packs, 15 cigarettes a day. That loneliness is as lethal, is as bad for our bodies, our health, as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And then 2020 happened, and we realized that it was much worse than we realized. That, it, that loneliness literally is lethal for our hearts that we wither without relationship, that we, if we don't have the ability to have relationship with each other, then we wither. We were built for relationship, first with him, but deep inside of our hearts, God put inside of us a desire and a longing and a need. Maybe we can't express it all the time, but we need each other. We were never created to live this life by ourselves. And the reality is that what COVID exposed and what, what this study exposed in 2018 is not new because scripture already told us that. And it didn't take long. It's in chapter two of the whole Bible. As God creates everything, he puts Adam in the garden, he names all of the animals and he sees that every animal has a mate and he looks at Adam and he says, it's not good for you to be alone. And so from the very beginning, God knew that we did, he created us knowing that we were not supposed to be alone. And it wasn't just husband and wife, they had kids, and then that was the basis of a society and, and, and community and all of that. They all needed each other to do what God had called them to do and to be the people that God had created them to be. We need fellowship with him, but he created us, and we need a place to belong, and we're looking for it deep within us. You see, what Christ did on the cross didn't just make peace for us with him. 
It's one of the, one of the most beautiful pictures in, in kind of the old school. If you grew up in a, in a church that, that every, during the service, you had that moment where you shook hands, right? You had to stop and you walked around and you shook hands. And if you were a guest, you're like, please don't do that. I know, I know. But the reality, like what that began as, like if you look back in history, that was a, a moment in the liturgy of the church where they would, the passing of the peace. It was a moment where I looked you eye to eyes and I said, I'm not in this alone. Peace be with you, and you would come back. Peace be with you, and I would pass the peace of Jesus that's come to me from Jesus to you, and you would give it to me because we're in this together. It wasn't a break for the band or a moment to make guests feel awkward. It was truly for the church to be reminded that we need each other, that he created us for that, and the peace that we have with him opened up peace that we have with each other, with all people, but especially within the church of God, and we need to be reminded. Fellowship reminds us it's important because it gives us a place to belong and a purpose to fulfill. The third thing is that this, that it's what it's characterized by, that fellowship is characterized by sacrificial love and unity. The church is characterized by sacrificial love and unity. If we go back to Acts chapter two, verses 44 and 45, it says this, that all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to one another who had need. Now this passage has, has definitely been used throughout history in, in, in some misunderstand, in misunderstanding or simple twisting of scripture to support some political ideals that I, I don't believe are in scripture at all, right? But what I do see, what this passage does tell us is that fellowship that these people, as they live life together and they shared everything in common, that it honors God when we share life together to the extent that I know your needs and I step into those needs when they arise. That it honors God when we, that when we step into each other's lives and I know you well enough to know that this is a, a moment of burden or struggle in your life and I can step in and you can step into mine. And that what, what this looks like and, and what this, what it's, what is an understanding of what it looks like to, to meet one another's needs. Paul gives us a, a, a kind of a, a passage that sheds light on that. In Galatians chapter six, it says, he tells the, the believers in, in this body, he says, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. It's Galatians chapter six, verse two. He says, carry each other's burdens. And so that's a part of what we do in fellowship is that we carry each other's burdens, that we come alongside each other and we help walk with each other and, and, and share those. It's characterized by this love and unity that we share this. But if you go down just a little bit in chapter, in chapter six, verse five, it says, for each one of us, Paul's continuing to write, but for each of us, we should carry our own load. Now, it seems like to me, if I'm listening to Paul, I'm like, you're talking about two different things. Am I supposed to carry my own load or share each other's burdens? And here's what, what I think we need to understand that there's, there's two different things that Paul's talking about, and it really is important for us to understand. That in what Paul says in verse five is that you carry your own load. And for us, that means that the things that are normal life for us, right, I'm supposed to raise my kids, that's not your responsibility. Now I bring them to church and, and I ask you to be a part of that and, and be a part of student ministry and kids ministry and, and share in that thing. But, but I'm ultimately responsible for my kids. I, if, when I go home, I'm not waiting for one of you. This would be great if you did it, but I'm not waiting for one of you to come and mow my grass. That's my responsibility. I had kids so they could do that. And I'm passing that on. Empty in the trash, you don't need to come empty my trash. That's my load. But there are moments in our lives, maybe because of a sickness, maybe because of a loss of somebody, maybe because you welcomed a new child in your life and you've experienced this where the body comes around and they carry your burden. When it, be goes, when it goes beyond your load, the things that are your responsibility, when it goes beyond that, and it's a, it becomes a burden, and the church, the fellowship of the body comes alongside and says, let me help carry that for you right now for this, for this run, this season that you're in. And that's a moment of sacrificial love and unity that we see within the church that shocks the world outside. Why would you do that? 
Why would you go and mow their grass when, when the, the husband is, or the wife is down and, and, and doesn't feel good or when something's happened tragically in their lives? Why would you bring them food? Because that's sharing the burden, sacrificial love and unity within the body of Christ inside this fellowship. Recently, personally, and as a campus, we experienced this. We, at, at the campus at, at Columbia, God is doing incredible things. I love that group of people who are gathered this morning to be able to worship together, and God is doing incredible things in them, and, and God has given us a load, a ministry that we get to carry out in Columbia, and by his grace, we're reaching people in Columbia. But a, a couple of months ago, we had an opportunity, came our way, that we, to be able to purchase a building in Columbia that could be a new home for us. And it was really exciting, but the reality is that that was not something that our campus could do on its own. We can carry out the ministry that God's given us, and those who give in, in Columbia, they, they give, and we can do that ministry there, but we were not able to put a down payment or start that process alone. And we received the fellowship where you, with sacrificial love and unity as the church, as Rolling Hills, said, we're gonna give. In our red envelope giving that happened at all of our campuses and online, all of that money went towards a down payment at, at, for Rolling Hills Columbia. And I wanna celebrate and thank you. We had a, a goal of about $300,000 to be able to put a down payment on our campus, on that future home. And I wanna tell you that this morning, just kind of as a report, there were $307,000 that were given for that. Amen, hey, yes, thank you. So now, in just a couple of months, I don't have the timeline settled at this point, but in just a couple of months, it'll be me and Pastor Jeff on there celebrating the grand opening of Rolling Hills Columbia, and I would love for some of you to come and be a part of that. I'm not trying to steal you. Don't tell Jeff I was trying to steal you. But you can come on that day, and if you want to stay for another couple of weeks or years or whatever, that'll be fine. <laughs> and I just want to thank you for that. That was sacrificial love and unity that's marked, that marks the fellowship of God's people that says, yeah, we're going to give. And listen, you weren't going to get anything out of that here at this campus. Your kids didn't benefit from it. The students didn't benefit from it. There's no more chairs in here. There's not more parking for you or another golf cart, right? We benefited, and I'm thankful for that. That's the sacrificial love and unity that marks the fellowship of God, and, and I, I wanna thank you for that. It shocks and surpasses what's expected and what the world thinks. And the fourth thing, we'll kind of move quickly here. The fourth thing that's there for us is that fellowship result, results in individual and kingdom growth. That fellowship results in individual and kingdom growth. When we, when we worship together, when we fellowship with one another, you can look in the movie and see it, when, when these kids got on that bus and, and, and Coach Boone gave them this, the things that they had to do there and live with different guys and, and separate on the buses and ride down there, it was not easy, it didn't happen overnight, but those kids left that moment different. They grew in that moment of fellowship. There's an incredible picture of what happens, and because of that, those individuals that grew, and, and let me give a plug for, for camp. That happened at camp in the movie, right? And, and camp is happening, and I think registrations are open for kids and students. If you haven't signed up your kids for camp, you need to sign up your kids for camp because it doesn't just happen in the movie setting. It happens in real life where lives are transformed and growth happens at camp. You're welcome, Chase, for that plug. But here, here they are, their lives grow. Fellowship happened and they grew beyond the things, the, the, the preconceived notions that they had, their lives grew. And as you look in scripture, what it says in Psalm, in, in Psalm 133, verse one, it says, how good and pleasant is it when God's people live together in unity? It is good and pleasant when we live together in fellowship and unity with one another. Because what happens, Proverbs says that iron sharpens iron. When we live life together, when we do what God's called us to do, it results in us growing in our relationship with him with individual growth. We grow more like Christ when we're around each other and we share life together. It's an essential part of who we are. We say it on a regular basis. If you're not in a community group, if, you're, if you haven't made that step, maybe your next step is to step in a group where, where, we, where circles, where, where we meet in circles, and we believe that growth happens much faster in circles than it does in rows. I'm glad you're here on Sunday mornings. Pastor Jeff is glad you're here. I'm glad our, our, our campuses are there. But we believe that growth happens much faster in circles, in groups of people, small groups gathering 
So we believe in that fellowship, this fellowship, but also those small group fellowships where we encourage one another and we grow because of it. Iron sharpens iron, and, and, and by the way that we love each other, the world will know that we belong to him. Listen to what John, write, or John tells us that Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 35. It says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. What Jesus tells us is that the way that we love one another, the way that believers, Christians, the way that we love one another will be a testimony to people who are not a part of the family, not a part of this fellowship yet, because they've not put their faith in Jesus yet. It will tell them that we belong to him. It will be a picture from the outside for them of something that they know that they long for but they don't have yet. That the world will know who we belong to by the way we love each other. Truly, I, I wrestled with whether or not to say this this morning. Truly, as we go into, in the next couple of years, a, a, a presidential campaign, which sometimes is dreaded territory for me, because of what I've seen in the church, the reality is that it should be prime time for the church. Prime time for people that don't agree on things to love each other well. It should be the moment that our culture around us says, something's happening with those people that's not happening anywhere else. Because I know they don't all agree on things. But they can fellowship and love one another regardless of what they agree on. And that's got to be a moment for the church. It's got to be. It's got to be a moment politically and in and, and, and other areas of racial divides and all of the different things that we can say, we can, we can be a picture of what it means to say, I don't agree with you on everything, but I agree that Jesus is our only hope. And I can fellowship with you, not because we agree on political matters, but, but we agree and we're family in Christ. It should be a moment for our church, for all churches, but for us to shine because we're gonna keep our eyes on Jesus. And what it says in this passage, what happens when those people, and you go back, I think this is incredible, you go back to Acts chapter two, all of these people who are living life together, if you go back to verse, the first, pers- first part of this passage in verse five, it says that all of these people that were there, this 3,000, this great swell of people who trust Christ, they're all in Jerusalem for this moment and they're from all different places. It says every nation under the sun. They didn't live in the same towns. They didn't have the same problems. But all of the sudden, God's spirit moved and everything came together. And not because they agreed with each other, but because Christ had transformed their lives, they committed themselves to fellowship. And they lived life together. It's a beautiful picture of what, we, what it can look like. And because of that, it says in verse seven, they praise, they, they praise God and enjoyed the favor of people that are around them. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. My prayer for us as we talk about fellowship is that this would be the kind of explosive fellowship that Rolling Hills and all of its campuses and online and all the churches in our community have, where God, where fellowship happens in such a way that we praise God and enjoy favor of the people that are around us, and every day, God adds to the number of people who are being saved, because they're looking from the outside and saying there's something about those people, something about the way that they interact, and it's something that's deep inside my heart that I'm longing for, even though they can't put words to it. Let that be true of us, to have that kind of fellowship. The fifth thing is that fellowship, is, fellowship in reality is messy and not without suffering. Again, if you go back to the movie, these guys, it didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen just in, in one fell swoop, right? It happened over, over time, but they did. It, they, they became a team. That, team. that team fellowshiped and they loved one another and nothing got in between them, not even the things that normally would get in between them. And they went back to town and it didn't happen overnight there either. But as they saw these guys commit to each other, the town changed in that way as well. And so what we see is that fellowship, but, but all in the midst of that, there was lots of mess. 
There was lots of struggle in the midst of all of those things happening, and it's messy. Listen, we're not going to do this. We're not going to live life with each other and, and avoid mess and, and suffering and sorrow. We're not gonna do it. It's gonna be a part of this life of fellowship together, but it's worth it. It's why, what it, it's why it says that they devoted themselves. They gave themselves over to this, not because it was easy and convenient, because it was important and it meant everything. They devoted themselves, and we as individuals have to say, beyond the mess and beyond the suffering, we're gonna step in. We're gonna see God do incredible things as we step into each other's mess. And that suffering, and, and in that, we'll see God move and do incredible things. The last thing is that fellowship is a preparation for eternity. And fellowship is a preparation for eternity. John writes in Revelation, this beautiful picture, and at the end of time, and when we're all together, when, when, when he's brought us before the throne, that it says that every tribe, tongue, and nation are before the throne. And throughout Revelation, he gives these beautiful pictures of what it looks like to be in heaven, to be with God forever, to be in, turn, to be in eternal relationship with him and with him that but the beauty of that picture that we cannot miss is that every tribe, tongue, and nation, people that look different than you do, people that, that lived in different places than you live, people that have different experiences, the rich and the poor alike, all together, all of those things gone, worshiping the Lord together for eternity. So on earth today, one of the greatest pictures that we can give the world around us, the one of the greatest pictures we can have for us to encourage us is fellowship with one another. Where even though we come from different places and maybe we look different and we have different experiences and we're, we don't have, we're not in the same social economic strata, but we are together. Every tribe, every tongue, and every nation celebrating his goodness. It's preparing us, and it's a beautiful picture for the world around us of what eternity's like. Fellowship is a part of who we are. Fellowship is a part of who we are. As the band, they, we're gonna sing just one song and just kind of close this out, but I'm reminded in, in the movie, kind of at the end, the, the, the little girl, um, Cheryl Yost, at the end, she's older and she's kind of giving this narration over uh, the kind of the closing. And it says, it says, people say that it can't work, black and white. But we here, we here made it work every day. And we have our disagreements, of course. But before we reach for hate, we always, always remember the Titans. And at, I thought about that quote this week. It's one of those many that are just great quotes in this, in this movie, but and it reminded me something that's written in Hebrews as the writer of Hebrews says this, that therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us, the sin that so easily entangles us, and run with perseverance the race that is marked out before us. I, I think about this they remember, she says, they remember the Titans when they wanna reach for the things that would divide them. And I think about those who have gone before us, the many men and women, the saints of old who have gone before us that have plowed ground so that we can have fellowship with one another. We can have fellowship with the Lord and that fellowship can allow us to have fellowship with one another. And so this morning, I, I don't, I don't wanna remember the Titans. I wanna remember the saints, which is, good because I'm from South Louisiana, which means my team is holier than yours. We didn't win a lot, but we're holier. Remember the saints who have gone before us, the men and women who have shown us what it looks like to commit, to devote ourselves to fellowship, and what happens when we do so, that lives are transformed, and our burdens are carried we grow and so does the kingdom. Let me pray for us and then we'll sing a song of response. Jesus, we love you. 
We thank you that you've loved us first and best and always and that your love never fails. God, we pray that in this moment as we just celebrate and sing a song of response to you that you would be glorified and that our hearts would be warmed to you and God, that we would, if, if the invitation is one that we need to respond to you in faith, that God, you would begin that work for it, that you would draw us to yourself. God, if there's restoration that needs to happen with fellow, fellow brothers and sisters in this room or somewhere else, God, that we would take those steps to restore those relationships because this fellowship that you've given us is sweet and it impacts the world. In Christ's strong and mighty name that we pray, amen. Let's sing together.